thousand times we uncaged. Welcome to Topple Uncaged. I'm Steve Topple and you're locked on to the UK's hottest politics and music podcast. Each week, I bring you the rawest takes on the big stories making the news, always joined by a very special guest. Then, I pleasure your mind, body and soul with the freshest, most banging international music going. Okay. Original. Well, if the music sounds sweet and the people them a dance, I must the reggae music, nothing else, now have a chance, love. Watch ya. I say, hey, Mr. DJ, play that one again. Well, this a reggae music where the people them defend, and from now till the morning vibes in our end. Me love to see the uptown and get a people blend. I say, my guest on today's show is quite literally a global star. He released for my money in 2018 his seminal work, and to be honest, I think one of the albums of the decade, as I wrote in a review of its last year. It is an absolutely stunning hybrid of genre musical styles plus with some of the most conscious lyrics going um i have to say i'm a bit excited to be sitting here because i'm in person with the man in question today as opposed <laughs> to skype which is how i usually do my interviews i'm so excited to be able to fire some questions at this man because he is a star and the album contraband will stay with me for the rest of my life so it's a real privilege and honor to be able to sit here and speak to kabaka pyramid kabaka thank you so much for coming on i'm genuinely excited to be yeah able man to speak give to you. thanks man give Thanks. Glad to be here, man. Thank you. I appreciate those words about the album, you know, for real. I haven't started yet. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't even begun on contraband. But no, it's a real privilege to have you, and I'm very excited to meet you. So thank you. I will try and keep calm. Um, (laughs) Just bringing up to speed on what you've been up to, you've done like this massive tour this year, and you've been playing loads and loads of festivals, and we were chatting about it off air. Um, How's the tour been? How's the reception been for you this year compared to sort of previous years? What's what's the vibe been like? I mean, it always gets better and better every year. That's what I notice. You know, people more familiar with the music, you know what I mean? And the fan base is growing. You know, we're doing different festivals. As I mentioned, we did some shows with Chase and Status this year mm. that brought us to some festivals that's not really, you know, reggae isn't really the priority at those festivals. So it's like a different demographic, like Park Life Festival, mm. Puckle Pop in Belgium, you know, we were in Estonia, you know, all over. And of course, we did some of the traditional reggae festivals like Summer Jam, you know, in Germany. We did Color Cafe in Belgium that we've done a couple of times now. And, you know, it's just great. It's a great experience. It's, it's a long tour. Yeah, we've been on the road same. from early June. You know what I mean? You haven't and finished yet. Yeah, we have, we have one more month. So, we, you know, the band is gone back, but we're doing some more shows, you know, in Japan, you mm-hmm. know, with a sound system, Jaworks over there. So that's going to be crazy, you know, the first time going to Japan. So looking forward to that. What do you think the Japanese audience is going to be like? How do you think they're going to be? I mean, I've seen videos and stuff, and it looks crazy over there. It looks yeah. like they really know the reggae and dancehall. You know, I get some places it seems like it's more roots reggae, mm-hmm. like that into that and that alone and then some places is like dancehall you know because a lot of japanese come to kingston and they got to pasa pasa and they got to all of the they got to you know where the wednesdays and all of the different mm. you know dancehall parties and you know I, I believe there was a dancehall queen from japan once oh, okay. you know what i mean I yeah like so that. yeah they, they really love the music and they you know what i mean japan sounds always linking us over the years for like dub plates and things like that so you know, it's definitely been, they, they've been supporting the culture, for sure. Excellent. And you, you touched on Chase and State, as I wanted to ask you about that, actually, because um, Murder Music that you did with them, it was yeah. kind of like this, it was, it was drum and bass, but obviously it had sort of elements of jungle in of it as course, well. And it was course. a real kind of brilliant track, don't get me wrong, it was absolutely amazing. But I'm interested because obviously, I mean, especially in this country, jungle was originally derived sort of out of reggae and of out of ragga. Um, and was that kind of move into that kind of style of music, was it was something you're interested in doing kind of I mean, because your background yeah. is hip hop and it, reggae isn't it? exactly um, I, I, I'm always interested to see the, the kind of offshoots from reggae and mm-hmm. reggae culture you know what I mean and when I see how even Chase and Status do it is it's basically coming from sound system culture you know what I mean and and I've heard a little bit about how jungle came about you know with using the vocals and putting them over different types of beats which yeah. is it's basically like what we started with the music doing you know taking reggae and dancehall vocals putting them over hip hop beats that's how we started as 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 a sound system in mm-hmm. Kingston you know and that's how I got my break into music you know so it's it's just interesting to see how the culture you you know, has 
you know, spawn these different elements all over the globe. And, and I definitely was interested in doing something within jungle because I like the I like the vibe of it. You know what I mean? It's it's very heavy, the bass, you know, all of that. And it's a different vibe, but definitely appreciate it. And I appreciate the, the, the organization of that aspect of the industry too. So yeah. it's another avenue for us. You know yeah, what I mean? Because we're all about you know expanding the avenues for you know jamaican artists to see revenue too so it's mm. definitely an important step yeah there is a, i mean sort of in this country as well jungle and drum and bass is something that's never really gone away either yeah. it's been quite a constant since sort of the early 90s True. it's had incarnations sort of yeah of resurgences and then yeah yeah, yeah it's, but it's always, always been bubbling on the surface and sort of chasing status and a few other artists sort of brought it back yeah as it were. so it's, it's again it's quite a so would you say they kind of brought it to the mainstream or, or it, it had its it had its height like that in previous do you know what when, i mean in my lifetime i'm, I'm 38 and mm -hmm. what's happened is because i remember jungle starting in the 90s and you sort of started off with sort of shy effects um uh, who are still obviously going in these days and it was really really jungle yeah. true jungle was really popular in the 90s okay, and then it kind of okay. morphed into drum and bass and then when you had sort of the rise of garage music and then yeah. that the incarnation from that which was grime music okay. it kind of took a back seat for a while gotcha. and i think acts like chase and status and shy effects are still sort of performing and still quite big um and the way they've reworked other people's tracks as well and i mean chase and status what they do particularly well is they bring in acts from outside of the D, &D arena yeah um to do essentially what you do like, like what we did of course this, this amazing crossover True. so and, and i think like well, I want to talk to you about sort of reggae and how it's morphed over the years. Mm -hmm, but in the mm -hmm. same way, reggae's morphed, drum and bass has morphed as well I to keep you. itself relevant. But the, the sound is essentially the same. It's true. It? It's, just, it's just different, different mechanisms. Yeah, I get like the, the arrangement, like building up to that kind of, you know, the crazy drop. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. drop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I get, <laughs> those elements are always there. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And it's, it's fascinating, fascinating history in relation to reggae as well. So, um, obviously, I have to ask you about contraband. Um, we have to. Have have to talk about that i know it's sort of where are we now we're august i mean it's nearly 18 months isn't it mm -hmm. since you released yeah, it yeah. um as i said in the introduction as i wrote in the review last year absolute masterpiece it literally is an album which i will think of probably when i draw my last breath on this earth <laughs> it's such a phenomenal album kabaka appreciate um, that just not least obviously the lyrical side of it um the messages you put across and it, it's the way you tell the stories in the messages as well yeah um it, it really fucking out there messages as well um especially africans arrive the reference you mm -hmm. made to Gaddafi, yes um and then um it, it, that whole track borders with the, with the mm -hmm. sort of the narrative in that of course um very strong very kind of in UK terms, would be considered yeah. quite radical messages. Radical, yeah, of um, course. Which they were. But, and musically as well, I mean, I compared it at the time, and I think I, a few people sort of said to me, really? And sort hmm. of raised their eyebrows at me. But it, I, I believe it's true. I compared it to the miseducation of Lauren Hill. Okay. I compared it to that because, firstly, because of the messages that you contained yes. within the project. True. Um, and the way you interspersed the stronger messages with more um, kind of tracks you can brack out to. Yeah, like, yeah. Like um, reggae music. Of course. So, which is a master stroke of anyone who's trying to get a message across. But musically as well, because the, the, just the, the, firstly, the genre smashing, mm -hmm. if you like, which was predominantly between reggae and hip hop um, yeah. a, a lot of you lost almost completely sort of the one drop um, yeah, from reggae yeah, yeah, throughout yeah, the sure. album and you more introduced the kind of hip hop kind of snare boom and, yeah, and, yeah exactly. exactly throughout but then you kept the bubble pattern yeah. on a lot of tracks <laughs> of and it course. was like hello I, I love what you've done here but then it's the way it, it's the way you interspersed all different genres as well I mean so you had Borders which is obviously a stone boy mm -hmm. which is a predominantly Afro beat track yeah. um, My Time and Make Way were kind of but they were sort of revival reggae yeah, as yeah, such. Yeah. As I said, so they yeah. dropped the um, one drop. The one drop. Um, but they kept the bubble pattern and they mm -hmm. introduced, so I sort of heard bits of dub and there were still bits of hip hop going on. Yes. Um, you reminded me of the Isley Brothers on Natural Woman. Um, <laughs> yeah. That kind of really chilled back, of kind of course. laid out, kind Doom. of soul. That, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Exactly. Um, and then the final track just completely blows your mind <laughs> because you then, you then produce this gorgeous, gorgeous almost ballad sort of r&b yeah, kind yeah, of ballad with yeah. natalie rise all i need which is absolutely stunning and i've already told my girlfriend that that's going to be one of our wedding songs, wedding songs. it is going to be one of our sense. wedding songs um 
and also then you touched on dancehall with kind of caught up which mm-hmm. is kind of dancehall but it's also it's for my ear it's got elements of kind of two-step in it which yeah, is um, true. kind of a it was big over here in the noughties this kind of garage sound where okay. they they took away the four to the floor kind of beat mm. and introduced two step which had lots of kind of um, tinkering kind of on the stairs and the hi hats okay and, um, I get you no, yeah I get you yeah there's no you. set drum pattern true it tends to be on the two and the four beat mm-hmm. where the main drops and then there's tinkering in the background okay. and you kind of you, there was incorporations of that into it definitely um, my point being it was so musically inventive and clever. Um, and inspired and obviously the production um, on a lot of the tracks which was by Damien and Stephen Marley yeah. um, production was top quality the arrangements were top quality the backing vocals um, <laughs> were were masterful in terms of incorporating elements of gospel and soul yes, and some calypso yes. parts with a certain rhythmic kind of, of backing course. It was it was a phenomenal piece of work, absolutely <laughs> stunning album, and as I said at the time, probably one of the albums of the decade um, thanks, for thanks. my money. <laughs> I'm going to take a breath. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, was that project to come to such a phenomenal piece of work? Was that a long time Definitely. to get to that point? Yeah, it was. It was. It, it was about four years in the making because it, it the basic the genesis of it was well done. You know, that was yep. the first time me and Damien really linked up in studio. You know, I wrote the song and recorded it in Jamaica, but then I flew up to Miami to his studio and, you know, him and his engineer, you know, were mixing it and I was a part of the session and that's where we kind of started to build our chemistry in the studio. And we started having reasonings about doing a project. You know, he, he was he's interested in doing more production, of course, as you can see now with Third World, yeah. you know, being kind of the... The second album in this new phase then of 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 Getter Youths was happening right now. Obviously, he did like, you know, the setup shop volume one, two, and three. He did you know Wayne Marshall's album yeah. as well, you know, and he's been instrumental in all those productions. But I think my album kind of it was it felt it felt like a turning point for for Getter Youths. That is exactly yeah. That is exactly it actually. Very yeah, interesting, I think yeah. I think that was his intention as well. Not just me saying it, you know, and thinking that, but it it definitely it definitely got him a chance to rewrite kind of the history mm. of what's happening there and and yeah, it was a, it was a brilliant experience. I brought tracks that I had from before and was working on, and we had like we had like listening sessions where we would listen to all the tracks that I had been mm. working on, you know, over the last maybe year or two. And then we kind of, you know, started from there and said, what, what could we produce to build on this? You know, and that's when songs like Everywhere I Go mm. came out of just, you know, organic, just creativity in the studio. Natural Woman, mm. you know, that was actually a song I had on a one-drop rhythm. Oh, okay. And we decided we wanted to do a different version. And Iris Soldier, another bridging of mine, was in the studio. He laid down the guitar, the original guitar. Paul played piano and mm. stuff like that. And we just started to build on it. Damien did the drums and the MPC. And, you know, that was the vibe for a lot of those songs that Damien produced. You know, um, Borders was a, a... I was in Jamaica when I wrote that one. He sent me the beat. He sent me a bunch of beats. Because, you know, naturally, you know, I'm still living in Jamaica at the time. I'm spending a lot of time in Miami, but... You know, he, he, he would be brainstorming and saying, what the album need? The album need, the album do have no dance hall. This time, Caught Up wasn't in existence yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and he was like, all right, let me send him, have some beats, you know, from back in the day. Let me fix them up, send him, you know, so I got that beat. And he was expecting like a, a nice, you know, love song or something <laughs> like that. And then he hear me talking about break those borders down, but he loved the song. You know what yeah. I mean? We all loved it. And, you know, it ended up being the second single. Yeah. You know, and yeah, that was, you know, it's just, it was very organic, you know, how the songs came together. Mm. You know, Make Way was Protégé, you know, Bridging. You know, Protégé has different, you know, guys we works with and, you know, this Bridging name, A-Track sent him a beat. And I linked Protégé one day and he played a bunch of beats that he had. Some he, he made with his team directly, some other producers in his camp would send him. And I picked that one mm. and I ended up doing a verse on it. I sent it to Pressure. Then um, Pressure actually came to Jamaica shortly after that. And, you know, he was at the studio for maybe 25 minutes. Is that and, it? And is he, that it? And he, he's like, <laughs> I just left him around there. You know, I left him around there. And then, you know, I left for maybe 15 minutes, came back. And he said, yo, I think I have something. 
<laughs> when the man <laughs> starts sing, it. make way, you know, rap bossing through <laughs> your gateway, and with us, you know, I said, all right, cool, we're done. And then he went back to Atlanta and he recorded it. You know, I added on the rest of verses. I re-recorded them over by Damien Studio, and, and then Protege got the, you know, he did the production and that, the mixing and everything on that one. So, you know, it was it was crazy. There's so every track has its own story, you know, and it's amazing how it all came together and how we could bring all these different elements. You yeah. know, Sherita did a lot of the background vocals. Mm. I know you've been paying particular attention to that. And there she goes. She's Peter, brilliant. She? Yeah, and, she's um, she, tomorrow, she, Friday the yes, yeah, Friday 26th. the thirtieth. Thirtieth? Yeah, thirtieth. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. right. Friday so that's coming out. Drops. Yeah, she's on the show next week, actually. Okay, nice. So, we'll brilliant, chat. brilliant artist, producer, you know, vocal mm. arranger, everything. She's amazing. Yeah, amazing. Go on, go and grab yourself a tea, coffee or any other form of refreshment you might like because me and Kabaka will be back with more chat in a second. You can kind of tell a lot of it was organic um, and, yeah. um, because it felt it felt natural, but it also felt like there was there was a real sort of narrative throughout the album, and, yeah. and, and that's what all the best albums do. I mean, of we course. were chatting um, off air again about King Mass, yes. absolutely fantastic release this of year, course, Crown, the Crown. Um, stunning, stunning. But which, of course, you were on with Definition yeah, of, of course, King, of absolutely course. brilliant track. Um, but that as well was another fine example of uh, how an album elevates itself from just being a record and turns into oh, an actual project yeah okay. exactly yeah. a project exactly. which has a sort of beginning middle and end and you leave um, very well listening. themed you know it's a concept album mm. you know i think he, crown is in terms of being a concept album i think his is a more perfect example but i definitely wanted contraband to be kind of that balance where because sometimes the thing i've noticed when 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 albums are are too conceptual, mm. it's like you you listen it once and then you feel like oh this is this is a lot to process and you don't end up listening it back over and yeah. over and over. So I kind of wanted contraband to have the balance mm. between you feeling the theme and you feeling the narrative, but it still feel like you know tracks that you can just vibe with yeah. and you and you can listen it whenever you want. You know I definitely wanted that balance because people are always telling me that. I remember Taurus Riley told me that my music is mood music. It's a particular mood you have to be in to listen to Kabaka. Yeah. So I definitely wanted to to diversify. That's why we put songs like Caught Up, you know, where we did songs like All I Need to bring diversity to. It's not just, oh, Kabaka is that deep artist, you know, but I can be deep in different ways. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's that kind of vibe. And I, I definitely love when we actually did the song Contraband. That's kind of when the whole theme for the album really emerged mm. and presented itself. It's like everything became contraband. Is 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 this contraband is is that you know that product or that substance that the authorities don't want it to have, but that we are pushing it. You yeah. know what I mean? We are we are smuggling it across the border. You know what I mean? And 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 messages like in make way, meaning a life, borders, these are things that you know, society that they, they don't necessarily want you thinking about these things. They want you thinking about, you know, money and partying and, you know, all of these things. But I think contraband, the consciousness within the music became contraband. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that became the album. I think it's a perfect way to sum it up. You you mentioned Taurus, he was on the show last week and he yeah. said he was very um um, very sort of adamant that it's important as an artist to have that mix between doing stuff as you're saying about um, when s s something's a concept album yeah. and, it, and it can be too much yeah, I hear, yeah. I'm not going to mention any names but I hear what you're, <laughs> I exactly, hear what you're saying exactly. it can be too heavy and yeah. you're just like no this is too much and you can't just flick it off yeah it, it's not that it's not brilliant you know but it's it's like you don't listen it for for the sake of enjoyment you know, if it's too deep, it's just like I was reasoning with somebody about certain movies. And there are certain, like like Matrix mm. is an example of a movie that's very deep, but it's still enjoyable. Absolutely. But a movie like, a movie like Inception is kind of... Yeah, that is it, too deep, it's isn't it? It's deep. It's like... It's okay. like I've only watched it twice and I love the movie. Yeah. 
so it's not that it's any it's not anything critical but it's just the reality it's too heavy yeah too too heavy yeah, yeah. And, the, and the way it's pre- um, presented as well exactly. it's still as a matrix is genius because yeah. you can you can either sit it and sort of think okay well i've taken the blue pill yeah um, let's, let's i'll really get into this or you can just watch it for the visuals yeah, you watch it for the, the visuals scenes. for the fights yeah. exactly yeah. and again exactly what contraband was and what taurus was saying was that he thinks the the artists who are at the top of their game, if you like, mm-hmm. are the ones who strike that perfect balance, balance. between making conscious music, mm-hmm. um, but also making people um, listen to it just to maybe chill just. out. And Borders was the perfect example, actually, true, of that, because true. if you wanted to just hear a sort of really nice kind yeah, of Afrobeat kind, yeah, of, uh, kind Afro of tune with a bit of Stone Boy on it, um, great, you could listen to it, or you could actually listen, listen to, to it. it. Yeah. Um, and get an education and get something exactly. from it. It's like so. that Kendrick Lamar kind of, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. that's another good example of one yeah. of those guys who strike the balance. No, absolutely. Um, and um, Black Hero is another mm-hmm. artist who I had on early in the year who released the Immortal Stepper. Another yeah. brilliant album. And he, he struck that sort of, trod Straight. that line extremely well as well. Nice. I mean, nice. What, as we discussed a little bit, what essentially the album did was take your. Um, previous as a reggae artist and your previous as a hip-hop artist yeah. and combine the two together and i mean since sort of the revival movement really got going in sort of 2010 2011 mm-hmm. we're seeing an awful lot of sort of this hybrid of yes. styles and the losing of the one drop and of course it's in- actually i found it really interesting the bubble pattern is always still kind of present though. yeah you, you don't get sure. away from that sort of the, the, bang the and plonk bubble. on the um on the piano. tenor clef and the yeah. sort of tune <laughs> of on the bass clef exactly. you did, that's still there but the, the traditional one drop is gone essentially mm-hmm. True. i mean um is is this kind of morphing and this um um evolving mm-hmm. of what used to be considered reggae do you think it's crucial for the sort of the continuation of definitely reggae and, I, I, and jamaica more broadly as I, well i think it's natural and it's organic mm. you know i think things kind of move in the way of the people and the way of you know, as consciousness shifts, different forms of expression shifts. And I think it's a natural process. Mm. I don't think it's something that we can really... It's, it's, like, it's almost like a force that you can't necessarily try to control too much. You know, you can for periods of time, like industries and labels, mm. they can push things on you. They can spend and promote certain things, but you can't stop change. That's one thing you can't stop. You know, and I think it's a good expression. I think it, it, it works in cycles. Because you will find that, you know, one drop will come back again. And then, you know, you know, dancehall is, is kind of at its peak right now. If, if, you, if you're really looking at it, like on a global scale, you know, because I think, you know, music is very dancehall and Afrobeat oriented yes. right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And a mainstream, you see mainstream artists kind of using it, you know, using that, that kind of drum pattern arrangement mm-hmm. and, and things like that. And, you know, it, it's becoming a world sound. You know, so I think on our side now with the reggae music, having those more aggressive drum patterns that if you just extract the drums alone, it might sound like hip hop or it might Mm. sound like, you know, um, like 80s reggae, you know, them them, them region there is like, I I think that is in keeping with the times and it, it makes it more accessible to somebody who is not necessarily schooled on like bob marley reggae or or peter tosh you know that era you know it it makes it more accessible presentable it 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 feels you know it feels more more dancey you know in certain settings and i think that you know at the end of the day people you know the, 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 the the industry of music is shaped around what is played, you know, in the dance, in the parties, mm. you know, on the radio, things like that. And at the end of the day, you want your music to be accessible. And, and we want it more to be accessible on a global scale. You know, we, we still want to maintain the, the elements and the dub and the, the bang and bubble and, and different things and, and the reggae bass lines and kind of show our identity mm. within the music. And I think that's always there. And even vocally, that's always there. As long as we maintain our identity vocally, it's always there. So I, I don't have a problem with the, the evolution and the shifting of the music. I think it's necessary, and I think you're right. It is sort of cyclic as well, because, yeah. like again, um, Third World, for example, mm-hmm. they got loads of sort of flack in the 80s yeah. for what they were doing in mm-hmm. terms of that they were steering away from sort of pure reggae yeah, and exactly. branching out into kind of funky soul, mm-hmm. um, that kind of area. And they got loads of flack for it. Yeah. Um, 
but they, they kind of, along with some other artists, really pioneered that of sort course, of development. Of and then it went sort of in the 90s, it went back to more kind of roots kind of sound. True. Um, especially over here with kind of mainstream acts like sort of Chakademus and Pliers. Yeah, and blah, blah, yeah, blah, 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 of course. That poppy kind of reggae. And it's, it's returned again to this experimental kind of um, hybrid sound. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, and you're right what you say as well, actually, um, with regarding having songs as reggae music mm-hmm. was huge for you, wasn't it? Blew of up. Of course, blew yeah, up, and up, that's up. traditional. Yeah, you know that's, what I mean? That's like, back to the late really, 80s, yeah. early 90s, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> sort of some irony there. Really, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. That, that you know, it's, it's like we didn't expect that one. Mm. We knew it was a good song, yeah. obviously, you know, and it, I have to credit Damien because... The, f- the original version of that beat was more hip-hop. Oh, okay. Yeah, it kind of had a more hip-hop swing to the drum pattern. Mm. like, And it was still, you know, reggae with the guitars and pianos and stuff. But he, he kind of saw a vision for it to be more like the rhythm with the shabba but I love all of the gundam keep them shine on Chris yeah, yeah, yeah. and that kind of doom, 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 that, that kind of drop with the mixing and things so even like when we kind of did that little mixing on the second verse it was based on them kind of vibe there you know and, and yeah so it, it really worked it really worked and you know, we dropped the video and the video just it just blew up for us, you know, relative to, to us yeah. on YouTube. You yeah. know what I mean? We drop it like January and it's it's going on to close to five million now. Yeah. You know, it's crazy and we definitely just love the support for that. And you know, the message in the song for me is very important too, because it's really paying homage to the music and talking about the importance of the music, how important it is to people abroad. And that we as Jamaicans recognize that look, this is our culture. This is this is our diamond mine. Mm. You know this music. You know, so we should really cherish it and be proud of it. You know what I mean? And yeah, sometimes you feel like the powers that be in Jamaica don't really see the total value in it because they maybe think that the reggae industry is is not, you know, as organized or it's still kind of this hustle vibe, but. Mm. You know, regardless of anything like that, it, it, this is what people know Jamaica for. You know, I always say reggae, Rasta, and Ganja. Mm. It's a trinity. And these are three things that are suppressed in Jamaica. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, what, what are we really doing? You know? Mm. So, but yeah, I think that song, very proud of that one. And, uh, you know, the success of it was really good for us. And it's three things that are suppressed in the UK as well. I mean, because London has got a big Rasta community. Of course. You don't hear about it. It's like, it's like um, I, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, Joe from Covered PR, who set up this interview, we were chatting yeah. off air. Um, and he said to me, he said, you're kind of one of the few people in this country who consistently covers reggae music. Sure. It was week in, week out, I cover reggae it's on true. my political podcast. Because my podcast is politics. Okay. But okay. the actual, but I, I actually do now more music interviews and anything else this is always reggae yeah um the reason people in the uk don't cover it is too dangerous mm. the message that it's bringing yeah of course for the for powers society, that yeah. be and the establishment yeah. if you want to call it mm-hmm. that the one percent whatever you want to call it it's too dangerous definitely um, they can't the have the people being awake yeah you know and, and it's crazy it's like reggae the, the, the those kind of messages that's the power in the reggae music that's the value in reggae music i think even in jamaica you know music that is not message oriented that's the music that seems to get most of the highlight yeah. in jamaica you know that's I mean? kind of you're kind of it's the music in jamaica is kind of quite divided actually isn't it because you have i suppose you have corporate dance hall on mm-hmm. one hand um and then yeah. you have the revival movement and artists who maybe um wouldn't necessarily fall under the revival movement yeah. but um who are sort of um outside but affinity, yeah, like good positive music yeah, yeah you know but it's kind of split isn't it and no, there, there's sure. few artists artists really who stray into both territories i mean yeah. bay c did it extremely well tail True. end of last year where he, he broke away from talk and well didn't break away but he yeah. moved from dance hall and produced this brilliant sort yeah. of conscious album holy temple which is absolutely fantastic um, and other dance hall artists have conscious elements i mean yeah um, of course like um who i had on a y- young upcoming artist called chrissy um mm. she kind of does a lot of dance hall tracks but then she produces some brilliant conscious work as well but For otherwise sure. You have the corporate dance hall, and then you have what, and that's it. what you guys, and it's kind of a it's kind of a metaphor for the whole of the world, really. <laughs> yeah, definitely, it? it's two sides. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I mean, I think there will always be that. Mm. 
you know but it's as you say certain artists manage to strike the balance i think chronix has done a good job mm-hmm. taurus riley has done a good job you know um yeah you, you have you have and then you have artists that don't necessarily associated with the revival like you know the chris martins the romaine burgers who keep themselves very relevant within the diaspora yeah. and show that you don't have to sing you know kind of slack dancehall music to be relevant in the diaspora so i applaud those artists as well yeah Romain you know, Burgos got you no really, for really sure good. for sure for sure yeah. you know and yeah the music is thriving you know and you know, there's a lot of potential for growth internationally. We see what Kaffee is doing. We see what Shensia is doing. You know, Jada Kingdom. A lot of these artists are primed to kind of, you know, go and break out in the mainstream world. You know, and doing the kind of music that, you know, the mainstream kind of gravitates towards. You know, which ultimately is good for the island and good for exposing Jamaica as long as, you know when you get rich spend it back in jamaica <laughs> you know what i mean yeah use it to build up the music industry you know maybe you know donate some things back to the music schools and all of these kind of things set up set up music schools i was i was saying you know was reasoning with my brethren them and i said oh we don't know of like a school you can go to to be like just an audio engineer in mm-hmm. jamaica you know what I mean? And and say you're dealing with that alone as your your priority and, and learning how to manage that situation. Stage management, them kind of thing there. You know, because those things are areas where we, we kind of, you know, lagging behind as far as Jamaica show business. You know, we have good engineers. Mm. We have, you know, people who are capable of, of being professional and stage managers and things. But in terms of an institution to train and, and you know that, you can have young people who have this certification and you know that they are ready mm. with practical and, 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 and technical experience. You know, I think that would be, you know, something that we can definitely benefit from. Do you think that's because the kind of push within the music industry and then the kind of perception of it is that you're either a star who's who's at the front of everything <laughs> exactly. or, or you're kind of nothing and that kind of the fact that the skill involved in, yeah. as you say, engineering or arrangement or production yeah. or whatever has is, is kind of been lost to, the fact, to, to, to celebrity, I suppose. No, for sure. But it's, 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 it's very similar in other areas too because when you're going to school, you either want to be a doctor a lawyer, mm. you know, somebody who is, is, is going to work in a bank. Or, you know, you have these jobs which are the equivalents of being a star. You know what I mean? Whether you're a star artist or a producer. And it's like a lot of these other jobs that in other areas of the world, people get respectable money, you know, being paid for certain types of jobs. People in Jamaica don't really get anything for that, like yeah. trade work and stuff like that. People don't, you know, to, to like... I understand, you know, every country has its own economic structure and everything. But, you know, like landscaping in certain places, a big money business, you know. And in Jamaica, it's like if you're a gardener, you, you're seeing like yeah. a very poor person, you know what I mean? You, you like you don't ever want your child to aspire to do something like that, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and, and I think these are perceptions that there, there's a lack of education around, you know, the structure of society and how it could be. And, it's, and that applies to the music business, mm. you know, where you have photographers, videographers, you have graphic designers, you have managers, you have st- road managers, you have stage managers, you have, you know, there's so many jobs within this music that if we paid attention to training people in the right way to doing it, then maybe people would get paid more because they're more professional, you know, and then you can see a, a difference as far as the industry. Yeah. No, absolutely, and it's kind, of, it's kind of the polar opposite in some respects in this country because what's happened over the past nine years here mm-hmm. is that jobs like nurses, for mm-hmm. example, now, um, we have, you, you probably won't have seen it, we have a real problem in this country with the fact that nurses on our National Health Service yeah. are having to take handout, food handouts from charities okay. because they can't afford to eat. And that's nurses. Crazy. And that used to be like a really sort of esteemed profession. Wow. People are not going into medicine in this country okay. anymore because of the fact that the government ain't paying enough. Mm-hmm. Mm, and nurses crazy. have to take charity food because they can't afford to eat. Wow. Um, it's, it's absolutely... It's crazy. It's kind of a polar opposite. Time for another break. If you want one, go and get yourself some refreshment because me and KP will be back with more talk in the just a bit. I mean, you, you, you kind of talk about that... Um, that kind of political corruption and mm-hmm. the the sort of rise of corporations um, yes. on well done. Mm-hmm. 
of one of the standout tracks for me because it's, it's a very genius track because <laughs> it's kind of this upbeat kind of well done yeah well yeah, done yeah. Um, it's kind of upbeat, but then yeah. a damning, damning, damning message um, with discussions of the IMF of and what politicians have been up to in Jamaica and how they're bribing the electorate with um, Kentucky and fries. Of course, and blah, 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 of course. Um, but is Go it, Thailand, all kind of things. Yeah, it's a very, very serious track. I mean, for my money, I mean, I've been doing sort of political journalism for about five years now mm -hmm. um, and things just seem to deteriorate at the minute and seem to be getting uh, getting and getting getting a lot worse yep. i mean not necessarily just in isolated countries but around yeah. the globe yeah we look at brazil right now the amazon and you've, you've been posting crazy. a lot about that on social media i've noticed i mean Definitely. do you think we're at kind of do you think this is maybe the worst you've seen in your living memory for the for mm -hmm. the state of society and politics generally because it's it's a message you're quite heavy on in the album about political corruption I, th I think I think the more we become aware of what's happening is the more these things disgust us mm. you know it's like back in the day before social media a lot of people never used to pay attention to politics you know it was certain thing like you know older people or people who were interested in them kind of things they would or you would know about the politics in your country but not necessarily world mm. politics mm. and I think nowadays the average person you know is more privy to what's happening around the world so it's like you're saying really that's actually happening yeah. where maybe you know just like we, we look at all the, the killings that was happening in the u.s mm. you know when i watch certain films about like the 70s and them thing the same things was happening yeah. you know but how many people knew about it how much was it being broadcasted how much was it being suppressed you know so i think social media and, and the, the spreading of information has a lot to do with it but I think the fact that we have this mentality of a linear progression of human evolution and we're supposed to be getting better, mm. it makes it seem worse when these things are happening. You know, and it probably is worse because we should know better. Mm. We should know about the effect of the environment and, and, you know, whether you want to call it global warming or whatever it is, we can see tangibly that the weather is changing, that species are dying. Mm. And, and to know that somebody can be in power and be overseeing the burning down of our, or, you know, our, one of our largest isolated oxygen sources in the Amazon. It's crazy. You know, and to know the same thing is happening in cockpit country in Jamaica right now, you know, with bauxite mining and all of these things in, in people's homes and lands, you know, and indigenous land to the nation. And, you know, the same thing is happening up in Hawaii. You know, I was up there, you know, and they're, they're trying to build this big telescope on the highest mountain in Hawaii. Mm. You know, where the, 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 this is where p people are getting their river source, their water source for like the whole entire island. You know, the majority of the island is getting and they want to pollute it with these toxic chemicals that will be coming uh, for this. You know, they, they build mostly like something like they build 12 telescopes and like eight of them not even working anymore really? yeah it's some some kind of number like that okay. you know and they want to do another one and it's crazy and and to see you know but the other side of it you know they're able to, within within maybe 14 maybe 13 days they rallied three thousand people up there to protest okay you know and that's that, that's, that's amazing too so you know we know that information is spreading positively and negatively mm. you know but we really have to do something about it. And I think, you know, doing songs like this is just my little, you know, drop of water in the ocean of change, you know? I mean, this is the... Yeah, exactly. And this is the thing. And I think, I think there's something to be said for the fact that... Um, we've been polarized as a species if you like by social media because mm -hmm. we're now i mean there's very distinct two groups of people really on this planet there's those who are woke yeah. and who are aware <laughs> yeah. of what is going on sure. and there's those who sort of if you want to coin a matrix kind of analogy have taken yeah, yeah. The red, pill red pill and pill. just switched off from it all of course. and it's very polarized and and it's and i suppose it's a case of waking up more people and definitely and that's when social media is a force for good mm -hmm. um but as, and especially in terms of what's happening in the Amazon, I mean, you'd think that in 2019, um, with everything we know that as a species, not one person would consider doing something like this. And yet Bolsonaro seems to be sort of probably yeah. have a hand in it somewhere. Oh, and we know course. US mining companies have got a very, very big hand in it. It, it still amazes me that 
I shouldn't be shocked by news, but I still am. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? It's still shocking. I shouldn't be. I know all this shit. I know True. how bad these people are. True. But it still shocks me. It True. still shocks me. Um, it's, yeah, it's sad. It's sad. But, you know, as you say, you know, pe- more people are becoming awake. Hmm. More people are, you know, waking up to what's happening, becoming enlightened to these situations. And we've seen how the effect of social media cause i think it was norway to 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 want to back out of their deal with getting beef from brazil yeah. to kind of stall this whole beef industry you know reasoning for this you know clearing all the lands and things so we see the power of social media mm-hmm. to make change because i'm sure they've known that it's not like this thing is just happening now they've been getting beef they know that land is being cleared to get beef but because yeah. social media put pressure on True. them now yeah. so it's, it's a real force you know and we have to use it yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's, it's very apparent in the UK at the minute because we've got we've got a massive controversy about Brexit at the minute and the fact that mm-hmm. Boris Johnson is going to be shutting down Parliament. And immediately, as soon as it was announced, yeah. um, immediately petitions went online, immediately demonstrations were organised, mm-hmm. um, and that forced a lot of MPs, interestingly, to go, oh, OK, well, no, we don't agree with this. This is okay. very, very bad, and, and we'll, <laughs> we'll protest with you um, after true. they saw the public reaction. Of course. So, yeah, yeah, I think it can be a force for good. But I, th- I think music as well is crucial in this and that's cut that's why when i started doing this podcast that's why i went right well i'm going to do a politics section but i also have to have music on it as of well course. because I, I i think music and the arts more broadly are crucial in all of this and especially music because it because you find me one person on this planet who could say hand on heart they don't like some form of music yeah, in impossible. some way or another. I don't think that person would exist. And I think sure. music is extremely it's important. universal, yeah. And do you agree? I mean, do you think music is one of the sort of um, key ways which we can change Definitely. Music, us as a species and as a planet? Music programs people at the end of the day, for good or for bad. It's a programming tool. You know, advertising agencies use it, you know, Record labels use it, you know, movies use it to set the mood and set the tone for, you know, what they're trying to express. And it's definitely a medium, you know, for, for, for literally putting messages in people's minds. Mm. You know, so if you're going to do that, you might as well do something positive with it. That's my whole aim for doing music. That's, that's what gives me purpose and, you know, makes me feel good about performing the same songs every night. You know, yeah. yeah, you know, as an artist, you must kind of at some <laughs> points get a bit okay. So I'm singing, I'm singing, caught up again, exactly. Uh, again, exactly. I'm caught up in the song. I hardly even night. sing caught up on the road. Oh, okay. <laughs> I sing most, it's mo- people mostly want to hear like the message songs from me. Oh, okay, Excellent. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's you know, if every now and then I perform some of the love songs and things like that, but yeah, you know, it's it's crazy, yeah. And I mean, what's also present in your music, which is extremely consistent throughout it as well as the subject of africa mm-hmm. obviously because because you're rasta um, and um that is the motherland but it's a persistent and very strong messages as well as i said sort of earlier on the interview especially africans arrive some of the mm-hmm. messages contained they're very very controversial especially about Gaddafi. Of don't course. mention him in this country <laughs> bloody hell of course um, <laughs> you'll get locked up <laughs> never Straight. mind caught up um it, it, but very strong messages and i've noticed that it's always been there, um, mm-hmm. obviously, especially um, with sort of older reggae acts. But yeah. there's a lot more artists talking about Africa now and the situation for the continent mm-hmm. um, and talking about it in very, very positive ways. And yet there's... Uh, it's almost like, okay, so it, Africa obviously suffered at the hands of colonialism. Of course. It's now we always almost have this corporate colonialism is what I like Definitely. to call it. Because yeah. if you look specifically, and I, I wrote about it several times a few years ago, um, especially sort of mining in Africa, because mm-hmm. what most people don't know, mining um, and the export um, and import of diamonds and precious metals and minerals mm-hmm. is the UK's biggest export, okay. even though we don't take them from this country. Crazy. It's because we take them from Africa um, and they get traded out of London. Mm-hmm. So we really take all the money for them. Anyway, my Crazy. point being that there's this form of corporate colonialism that still exists. Um, there's, still, well, there's still colonialist attitudes, obviously, but I mean, it's now corporate. Because places like um, DRC, places like CAR, yeah. um, mind, 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 all their resources is pillaged, often yeah. with huge amounts of tax evasion involved. So no money is actually going back into the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of uh, 
that's why Africans Rise Again is one of the standout tracks on the album for me because you were straight to the point. There was no messing around with you. And, and you, you did this genius thing as well with juxtaposing your um, lyrics and your verse in it yeah. with Akon sort of contrasting, bit, yeah. which was from sort of with the shoe on the other foot of someone who's like, well, I don't care. Yeah, um, kind of, yeah. Care. <laughs> um, I will bleed. I will fight you for it. Um, sure. blah, 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 blah. Um, genius way of um, constructing the song, but a very important message throughout. I mean, do you think that we will see in our lifetimes because we're sort of similar ages mm-hmm. africa finally come into its own because there is a, there is this developing awareness of yeah. exactly what has been going I, on i think some uh, nations are prized for it are, are prime for it mm. i think i saw a, a list of the the top 10 fastest economies in the world and i think about five or six were african countries so you know we can see where like Nigeria, you know Ghana, obviously South Africa is you know pretty mm. much thriving. Certain areas, Kenya, you know Ethiopia, a lot of these places the economies are rising. But who is that in control? You know we know that is China doing majority of the development in a lot of these. You know I think it's um, Republic of Congo where basically china owns the port or owns their whatever they're they're shipping or mm. you know what i mean whatever they're dealing with there and yeah it's it's it's, it's kind of crazy for see but we know that the potential is there like like even akan said um africa is the only place where a black person can you know go from you can go towards being a fortune 500 mm. you know person within five years yeah basically yeah. you know you can you can become very wealthy you know be, you know obviously based on the populations over there and the, you know the, the potential for economic growth you yeah. know with businesses and there are a lot of small businesses rising up you know in west africa east africa you know so it's, it's definitely a lot of potential and i think we will see africa moving towards being a superpower yeah. you know i think it they, they will continue to suppress it or try to you know control that but definitely it's growing yeah and you know i haven't been there so it's like it's hard for me to sit here and talk and i haven't been to africa in this life that i'm living now so it's a little bit tricky for me to say but just reading observing talking to people you know and i definitely hope to reach there you know you know even by the end of this year This is your final interlude for a break because me and Kabaka will be back in just a few seconds for the last part of this amazing interview. You're spot on. I mean, what you say about China is fascinating because there is there's still this interference. So it's sort of the prime example for me is the situation um, with Sudan and South Sudan mm. because obviously Sudan was affiliated and very closely tied to China. South exactly. Sudan is very t- closely tied to the West. Okay. And that sums up the state of the, the country, that True. there are constantly foreign powers True. with their fingers in these mm-hmm. pies. Um, mm-hmm. And not that it's the same the world over. but not for sure. Uh, uh, but the potential that as you say africa has to be a superpower yeah. and should be the leading there needs to be strong leaders there need to be yeah. strong leaders to resist that kind of dominance yeah. from outside but do you th- do you think those right leaders are possibly there yet because i mean we've seen that the, the challenge always is i mean for me especially what was going in, on in sudan mm-hmm. recently and it's the same in hong kong as yeah. well what's happening in hong kong so you've got okay you've got china who's bad yeah. we don't deny they're an authoritarian state mm-hmm. um hong kong protesting about authoritarian china yeah but then the other option is that these hong kong protesters all they're waving british and american flags and yeah, it's like yeah, no yeah. You're missing That's not the answer. And, and and I see similar in sort of, especially with what's been happening in Sudan, where, okay, Dick Pot, um, Tim Pot dictator, yeah, fine, um, military military rule, fine. Mm-hmm. But then the other option is, oh, well, embrace the West. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but, so none of that's the right answer for me, as, anyway. As, as sad as it is, it's all pointing towards ending up in a one-world government. Yeah, I think you're right. It's just, it's just going in that direction. Yeah. You know, people are going to, people are becoming more awake and they're going to, you know, resist their own governments. Mm. And then somebody's going to come with a better, uh, quote unquote, yeah. better answer. Yeah. And then, you know, by the time you realize it is one world and it, it is very sad, but it seems almost inevitable. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and it's difficult in Africa because a lot of it is, is, is tribal too. You know what yeah. I mean? So th- there's just divisions that, is is almost in the blood. Yeah. 
you it's know, the same in the Middle East and Yemen as well, isn't it? With the, I mean, it's so divided by tribes. Exactly. So you, you, can, you, you kind of you can you can't be on the side of Houthis predominantly because then it's divided up into tribes anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult. It's you know, but mm. as I said, there needs to be strong leaders. I think you know, I I speak about Gaddafi because we know that he was trying to you know bring back the gold standard. Yep. You know, f- 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 for for oil, for money, <laughs> Sorry, trading, laugh, but yeah. they, and we wonder why they got rid of him. Exactly, you know that. You yeah. know that's why. And yeah. you know he was definitely. You know, f- for better or worse, he was a strong leader. Mm. You know, he was about what he was about and trying to get, you know, things that he wanted to implement that would have benefited Africa. You know, in my opinion. So, yeah. you know, it's it's crazy. So it, there has to be, you know, the leaders that arise. They have to. They have to be very diplomatic. Mm. You know, and, and kind of still build relationships with the West, but you know, just stand up for yourself, negotiate in a way that benefits your people, you know what I mean? And ultimately, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. Let's shift on from politics and get back to the music. Um, yeah. it, because you've uh, your history is quite interesting, um, because you've gone from you were a reggae artist, it was Raskas, <laughs> yeah, Raskas, Raskas, yeah. um, hip hop, you were Ronnie P, Ronnie and P. now obviously we're Kabaka Pyramid. Um, yeah. Is this Kabaka Pyramid the final evolution of you? <laughs> is, is this your final incarnation, or, Music, or what I, do you think? Yeah, we... I, I believe it's it's settled now. <laughs> I believe the name is settled now. I think I think I, I found the right balance, you know, over the years. Because I've never been, even from high school days, I've never been given a nickname. I've always had to come up with names for myself. Okay, you know, I remember even before after Raskas, it was Aine Kabaka. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, did you go? Yeah, because you, um, I read somewhere about the how you liked Dini Kamosi. Yeah, Dini Kamosi. Yeah, here, here that, comes that was about. definitely a factor in that <laughs> name for sure, for sure. You know, and um, yeah, so it was interesting to see, you know, the whole process I had to go through, you know, mentally when it came to the name, and mm. you know, when I found he was looking up African names and found Kabaka in Uganda, it means king. Yeah. So like okay, you know, Rasta, we always say king, Wagwan king. You know what I mean? It's it's always you know trying to live up to the standard of His Majesty. Mm. You know what I mean? So that has always been something that resonated with me, and you know, you know, merging the reggae and the hip hop side. Because at that time, you know, when I was doing songs on the name Aine Kabaka, it was like I was more singing than even now. Mm. You know, I probably didn't have as good a voice or a voice control. But I, I wanted to sing and kind of sound like Sizzler. Okay. You know yeah. what I mean? So I have songs like that. And there was no real hip-hop element in, in, do, in those songs. But you, know? you, you, you love hip-hop though, don't of you? Of course. Sort of Eminem, Canvas. No, but um, that's what I'm saying. Ronnie P, you know, is a straight rapper. Okay. You know what I mean? U.S. East Coast accent <laughs> rapper. You know what I mean? And... That, so it was crazy just bringing, bringing everything together and rebel music was kind of the epitome of mm. that. Even a lot of people say no, how oh, they want me to go back to the rebel music vibe. And even though I, I tried to <laughs> in contraband, you know, give people that balance, which you obviously have noticed. Yeah. But some people are still saying like, there is still like that rebel music vibe. Like. And I think a lot of it comes down to a lot of those beats were done with samples like we're sampling Aineka Mosey and different different you know old reggae and kind of sampling the reggae as opposed to playing it back Mm. and I think that's kind of the vibe that people have been missing and you know I have some plans to okay you know yeah (laughs) get forward to the sampling still you know what I mean and yeah, we'll see. But the balance is good because you do you cover all bases on contraband in terms of, of rapping, singing, and sing Jay. Um, so, and sure. I, I like the balance, obviously. Um, just to wrap up, because someone shoved a note saying I've got <laughs> ten minutes left, and that was Sweet. five minutes ago. Um, so, rest of twenty nineteen, Kabaka. What yeah. have you got in store for the rest of the year? You still haven't finished the tour, yeah. um, so you've got a couple of dates left on that. Yeah, so what else? Outlook Festival, and then we head yeah. to Japan. So, looking forward to that. Um, just working on new music. I have a video of dropping. Well, when this airs, it will probably be out already. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. we have, you know, we have a video dropping, and mm-hmm. um, I might do another video from the album. Who knows? You know, I might do a lyric video or shoot another video from yeah. the album because I still believe in those songs. You know what I mean? A lot of those songs, I almost wish I could have singled all of them. 
you know and yeah. you know but you know it goes already yeah. and um definitely you know doing doing a major show in kingston in december you know either one for myself or or protege or one of the you know we 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 we'll be doing a show you know, in a Kingston. Uh, hopefully, I get to go to Africa, you know, in December as well. Mm. We're talking to some people. We'll see. But, yeah, just working on new music now and getting ready. I have a rhythm producing. And funny enough, have it's you? a one-drop rhythm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have like 10 songs on it. And I haven't recorded on it. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so it's really a producer vibe. You yeah, know, so I'm, okay. I'm working on that. It's being mixed now. So when we'll see out? We'll see when I'm going to release it. I'm, okay. thinking, I'm thinking September, but I'll be on the road for most of September. Yeah, so yeah. maybe October. Okay. You know, so we'll see. And definitely want to do more production and get link up more artists together. Yeah. You know, and, and, and different, different people from different parts of the world. I want to link them together. You know, whether it's with myself on the track or not. Mm. You know, but just kind of be that, that bridge. Yeah. So, yeah. That linking is crucial, not least musically, but it's crucial for everything socially that we've discussed in this interview exactly. as well. We have to link up as best we can for in sure. as many ways as possible, I think, at, in these times. So, yes, and I think that's my 10 minutes is now gone, so I have to wrap <laughs> this up. My goodness, it's been an absolute treat to speak to you. It's Likewise. been fascinating listening to you. I've enjoyed it, enjoyed it, enjoyed it so much. And as I said, <laughs> Contraband um, for me was one of the albums of the decade. Give thanks, um, man. It will, I always hear tweets, man. And I <laughs> oh, you, see how you, you talk highly about the album and definitely fantastic. humble, you know. Absolutely, yeah, fantastic. Give thanks, so, and it's been a pleasure to be able to speak to you, Kabaka Pyramid. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Give thanks, man. Respect. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I have to be brutally honest about this. Of all the interviews I have done over the past 12 months, speaking to Kabaka was probably the most exciting one, purely because I absolutely love, love, love Contraband. It was a standout album for me last year, and as I said in the interview, it will stay with me until I draw my last breath on this earth. He is stunning, such a fantastically talented artist, but moreover, so consciously aware with thought-provoking and profound lyrics. So, what track to pick to play for you to sum up this artist and the whole of his album well it was a tough call because every track on the project is absolutely stunning and all of them could have been hit singles but i had to pick one so i've picked this it is called africans arise and if you listen to the lyrical content of it it is absolutely on fire my goodness does he spit some very very serious points during it and musically it's also brilliant as well this brilliant sort of merging of iberia and the music couple with some Afrobeat overtones. Absolutely stunning, stunning, stunning track. Here it is. It is Africans Arise by Kabaka Pyramid featuring the equally fantastic Akon. Africans Arise, Kabaka Pyramid, Akon. Check this out. Africans Arise and be strong, yeah. Keep hope alive and be the eye in the storm, yeah. Africans Arise and be strong, yeah. Keep hope alive And be the eye in the storm, yeah I beg you please excuse me If you're not an African child Stop digging up with African soil Crimes where them do to we we have it on file Them kill off Gaddafi we with African oil Conflict, diamonds, Ebola, syphilis Missionaries and we don't know what the mission is Politicians giving four force to the little kids Still the possibilities limitless Africans arise and be strong, yeah Keep hope alive And be the eye in the storm, yeah Africans arise And be strong, yeah Keep hope alive And be the eye in the storm, yeah Mama Africa, she bear the pain of the world on her shoulders and she never complain And even through the modernization of world, she still keep her ancient traditions to say The metropolitan city is bright and beautiful but be mindful not destroy the landscape Car, no matter your religion or national division, can't hold this your burning flame Africans arise and be strong, yeah, keep hope alive and be the eye in the storm, yeah Africans arise And be strong, yeah Keep hope alive And be the eye in the storm, yeah Hey God, huh. you see the ghetto every time I pass by These little you dying that don't know why I'm holding on to the piece of the pie Before I let you take it, man, I light it on fire Cause I will bleed and will fight you for it Neglect my woman Honor, respect me for money And if you's a soldier, you know that Cause I risk my life Just to get to the night 
And that's it. This mind-blowingly special episode of Top Lung Caged is done. I'd like to thank my fantastic guest this week, the incredible Kabaka Pyramid. Follow him on Twitter. It's at Kabaka Pyramid. As always, find the scenes. Thank you to the love of my life, the gorgeous Nicola Jeffrey. Follow her on Twitter. It's at Nicholas E. Jeffrey. My man behind the booth, sound engineer Gav Pauls. Follow him on Twitter. It's at Pauls with AZ Radio. And my in-house singer, it's Ray Star Music. Follow her on Twitter. It's at Ray underscore Star 113. Thank you to the Canary for encaging me. I will see you again soon. Uncaged.